This happened just this morning. I tested positive to influenza A. A. Anyway, I'm sitting down today with a cup of tea to give you the tea on a pattern that I just made, which is for this jacket right here. This is the Cheryl jacket by Vicky Sews. This is an independent pattern or what might be known as an indie pattern. And I haven't sewn that many indie patterns and I thought I'd just sit down and give you a little review on how that process went. Vicky Sews, if you don't know about them, where have you been? They're an absolute pattern juggernaut of the indie sewing world. According to their Etsy site, they have almost 2,000 patterns, which is kind of extreme. As with most things in my life, I am a bit of a latecomer when it comes to anything kind of good or trendy. And actually, sewing indie patterns is just one of those things that I'm, I'm really late to the party on. But I'm here now, so let's party with a cup of tea and a box of tissues. And uh, let's get into the review, shall we? The origin of this project is actually from about a year ago when I had been watching this show on Netflix called The Makanai, Cooking for the Maiko House, which is a Japanese TV show that's set in Kyoto and they are training to be, they're like baby geisha basically. And um, part of the thing about Japanese fashion that I love is that they're really good at layering. And one of the things that they wear are these quilted jackets that I just think are so cute. I looked them up and they're called Hanten. So that's basically the inspiration for where I started. But I didn't want to dive in and just do whatever I wanted because I was worried that I was going to mess it up. Um, and just to prove to you, here is 2023 Steph visiting the fabric shop to buy the fabric and actually get started on this project. I got the fabric from the Remnant Warehouse, which is in Sydney. It's great. They have heaps of quilting fabrics and I love sewing garments with quilting fabrics just because I think they're super duper fun. I also would like it known that I pre-washed this fabric, which is probably the first time in my life that I'm actually genuinely pre-washing something because I know it's going to help me later down the track. The major obstacle for me getting started on any indie pattern is just all the admin to get started you know a lot of the times you download these patterns they printed you print them out at a4 or letter size if they were in the US and then you've got to stick all these pages together and then cut out all the pattern pieces before you can even get started at cutting out the fabric and to me that is just a massive obstacle and a big barrier to entry that stops me from sewing indie pattern. Luckily last year I had access to cheap large format printing because I was an architecture student and so I printed these at uni for you know a fraction of the price of what you're going to spend going to a copy shop so I was very fortunate for that and for this I'm making the extra small slash small size. Uh, I'm going to talk more about the pattern and the instructions and stuff later but I'll just like talk you through a little bit of the process of putting this whole thing together and then as I go I'm going to give you little tips or a bit of my feedback about how I feel like this pattern is going. The A0 printouts are kind of big and it uses a lot of paper. I feel like maybe there could have been a little bit more attention paid to fitting the pieces better on an A0 size page just so you don't have to print three of them. But I kind of get it though because there's quilting lines which means that the back piece Usually you might just get a piece that's cut on the fold, but this is actually a whole piece in and of itself that covers one of the A0 sheets. So I kind of understand. <laughs> Hot tip that I have for you if you're cutting out one of these patterns is that if you have access to it, then get yourself one of these knives rather than using scissors. It's just a like, way easier to cut along the lines. That's a tip from me to you. Cutting out these pieces was really easy. They're kind of big, large pieces. So that was fine. Cutting out, cutting out the fabric was very simple. And then for the wadding, uh, it recommends to use, you know, like regular quilting wadding or wool or something synthetic. But I had all this felt lying around. It's acrylic felt, I believe, um, that my husband bought for some reason. And then he never used it for whatever he was going to use it for and so now I still have like a good couple of meters of this stuff left but I tried this out on a project that I did when was it last year I think I don't know I made these quilted pot holders which turned out really well and the felt was a good wadding I'm also using this just as a single layer because Sydney doesn't really get that cold in winter and I just want it to be another layer that I can maybe wear over a chunky jumper or something so it doesn't need to be that warm but I would say if you want it to be a warm jacket then use some quilting wool wadding or whatever you want to make it warm or maybe even just use two layers of felt up to you I figured out that I could just press these large pieces of fabric just on the ground on the carpet it hadn't really hadn't really occurred to me to do that before so next time I'm having it at a party and I need to 
iron a tablecloth. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna iron on the floor because that's so simple, right? Who, who knew? <laughs> Even though the back piece comes as one whole piece, it's really just easier to fold that piece, that pattern piece in half and just cut on the fold like you usually would with any sort of back bodice piece. I think, yeah, as I said, it really comes in that large piece because there are those quilting lines that you have to copy out. And that's a great segue into the next part, which was the quilting. This was my first time doing any quilting on a large scale and I wanted to use a pattern because I was nervous about just diving in on my own. And I feel like I learned some things from the pattern that I wouldn't have learned if I had just dived straight in and quilted. So good job me for uh, actually deciding to use a pattern, not just trying to wing it like I usually do. But I seriously underestimated just how long this whole quilting process was gonna take. I don't have transfer paper or anything, so I ended up copying out the quilting lines using my ruler and a bit of chalk and my fabric pen. And then what you have to do is actually baste all of the pieces together. This pattern is not meant to be reversible, but I wanted to make a reversible jacket. And so I wanted to make sure that I was copying out the quilting lines very accurately so that I could make sure that the pieces were all gonna look really nice and refined once I was done with the garment because I have been known to rush things and make things that are a little bit dodgy. And what I really am trying to do now is to take my time a little bit more with things and make things that I'm gonna wear for a long period of time that are high quality garments rather than just having a go at throwing something together. I feel like if you're just doing the regular pattern with a front and a lining, then you just need to transfer the markings only onto the front and not do both onto the lining. It took me a long time to do all of the pieces, but as I said, I'm glad that I did it because it really helped me to make sure that everything was looking really special. And then of course, like you, the whole thing is quilted. So you have to quilt the front and the back and all the sleeves. It was, it was very time consuming. I thought that I could knock this over in an afternoon. It ended up taking me days. And again, because I was making this reversible, I had to make decisions about thread colors. While I was transferring all these markings and hand basting everything, I was really thinking about what thread colors I wanted to use. And if I wanted to use the same for both sides, or if I was gonna use a top stitch thread and a bobbin thread in a different color, uh, I decided to do some little test, test pieces. Oh my God, I'm so sick. I was gonna use some thread from my stash, but I ended up going to Spotlight and getting this other orange colored one. And then I did some testing of the different colors for the two different sides to see how they were gonna show up. I eventually decided to go with the orange uh, rust colored thread for the purple side, and then a light green for the green and orange side, which originally I wasn't gonna do, but I, I, that's, that's where I ended up. And I think, it, I think it turned out better than had I used the orange on this side. One big benefit of this pattern is that the quilting lines are all just straight. It says in the instructions that you need to use a walking foot or a quilting foot, but I don't have one of those on my machine. I think that if you put all of the pins and the basting in really well, then you don't have to worry too much about the fabric slipping. This pattern does also allow for excess around the sides. My mum had warned me that when you quilt something, the fabric kind of shrinks, so you have to allow for a bit extra around the edges to trim off and make sure that it's all tidy before you start putting everything together. But the pattern does account for that, so that's good. And I really appreciated the basting being included in the instructions because it made me actually do it. Whereas if you've been here for a while, then you know that I'm impatient and I always skip the basting and that always leads to mistakes. So yeah, one point for basting, another point for basting. I think basting's had a few points lately. And then after you've quilted everything, the next time consuming step is to remove all of the hand basting. I kind of underestimated how long that was going to take, but thankfully I'd done it in a light colored thread that was different to the threads that I'd stitched with. So it was fairly easy to pull those out. There's just so many of them though that it just took quite a long time. But in the end, you end up with some lovely quilted parts that are ready to be put together. Also, I thought, as I said, first you have to trim off all of the excess and I do have a trick for that, but I'm going to let Pasta explain. I got my hair done this morning and I don't even recognize myself. It's kind of weird. So if I keep tripping out, then that's why. But I've quilted all of the pieces now and they look really great. But now I think that the next step is that I actually have to trim down the pieces because when you quilt stuff, like things kind of shift a little bit and then you have to, they also like shrink slightly. So I think that on the pattern pieces, you can see that there's these extra lines. So I think that I actually have to cut 
off like this much around the edge. Um, and the way that I'm going to do that is that I'm going to use my magnets and my scissors. One moment, please. So I've done this method before with other things and my husband has a collection of these magnets that he uses for random stuff and they're one eighth of an inch thick each. And so I think that if I look at this pattern, I think that it's gonna be five eighths of an inch that I need to take off. So rather than spending time marking everything out, what I'll do is I'll just put the magnets on the outside of my scissors and then I'll just cut around the line. And then also included in the instructions is that you have to edge stitch all of the pieces together, basically just to hold all the layers while you stitch or like construct the actual garment, which is good. I feel like that's something that I wouldn't have known to do because I haven't quilted anything before or made a quilted garment before. I did all of this edge stitching in black thread just to save my colored threads and also to make sure that I could tell it apart from the actual stitching. And then even before I started constructing this garment, I realized that I was gonna have to make a whole bunch of bias binding. In the pattern, it includes these bias strips, but recently I have seen on the internet a method that I did try last year actually when I made my quilted pot holders, but it just, it did not turn out very well. But I decided that I was gonna give it a go for this project because I needed a lot of bias binding. And I'm gonna talk you through it. There are other tutorials and a very handy article that I did refer to while I was uh, doing this process. You'll see me use my phone a couple of times. That's what I'm checking. What you wanna do is start with a square or a rectangle. And the size of your square or rectangle doesn't really matter. Just depends on, you have to think about how wide your bias is gonna be and also how much you need. So the bigger square or rectangle you start with, the fewer joins is gonna you're gonna end up with in the big long strips. So think about that before you start. But if you don't need heaps, just use a small square. You cut it on the 45 degree diagonal. Once you've done that, uh, you line, uh, flip over one of the pieces and you line up the verticals and then stitch along and just join it with a five mil seam or quarter inch. Then you press that open. And what you wanna do next is mark out on the diagonal side. So you have end up with this sort of parallelogram shape. So on the diagonal sides, you wanna mark out the width of your bias. I just used a biro and my quilting French curve all-in-one ruler. Just so you know, in this little demonstration, I mark one inch when I really actually wanted to mark two inches. So I kind of messed it up the first time and I had to redo it, which, you know, it was fine. I, you live, you learn. You fold over so that the diagonal sides are meeting up but you wanna offset the lines. You wanna join up the lines, but you wanna offset them by one. It kind of is a bit weird. And if you're using a rectangular piece, then you end up with this sort of long windy sausage. Stick to the process and you will reap the rewards. When you're lining up those lines, offset it by one and make sure that they're crossing over not at the edge of the fabric, not at the raw edge, but wherever your seam is gonna be. So mine was five mil, so I'm making sure that those lines are crossing over and I'm putting my pin exactly through where they're crossing over at five mils from the raw edge. Then you pin it and you stitch it all together. And if you can, press that open, I think, or if not, it's fine, you, you can like press it later. And then what you do is you very carefully cut it all into one big long strip. Yes, I did mess it up at one point and I accidentally cut through the other side. Oh well. But there you go. That's how you end up with lots of bias binding. It is such a simple method and I feel like it saves way more fabric and you can get quite a lot of bias out of a small piece of fabric, whereas a lot of patterns give you more fabric allowance because they want you to cut these giant strips on the diagonal. I'm so glad I know this method now. I have done it so many times. I kept running out of bias that I kept having to do it. And now it is just etched in my brain and it's great. I'm so happy about it. I didn't mind that lots of my bias had lots of joins in it because I'm using this pattern purple fabric and you can barely even tell where the joins are. If you're using a plain fabric to do this method, then I'd say make your square a bit bigger so that you can minimize those joins. 
Okay, moving on, moving on, moving on. After what seemed like an absolute century of making bias tape and preparing all of the quilting, I actually started to put this whole thing together, which was pretty... If you're just putting the jacket part together, so simple. But when you have this sort of garment where you have to bind the seams, much more time consuming. Again, something that I had not really registered that was gonna be time consuming. I decided that because this was gonna be a reversible garment that I wasn't going to just bind the seams but I was gonna bind them and then lay them flat and stitch them flat so that when it's turned to the like wrong side it doesn't like stick out. I'll show you. So for example, here is one of the shoulder seams and if I had just bound that without stitching it flat again, when I'm wearing it, it would like stand up and be this sort of ridge on the shoulder. And also you have a seam down the sleeves and down the sides. And I just didn't want that. So I did a very time consuming process of, I guess it's probably called flat binding. So you attach the binding in the regular way to the seam first. And then what I did is I pressed it flat and hand basted along the line of, uh, to cover over the seam. Actually, no, before I did that, it doesn't say this in the instructions, but I decided to trim the inside bit of the seam, the raw edge after I'd done the first bit of binding. And rather than just cutting it straight, I trimmed it once and then I trimmed the other layer, just one of the layers a little bit more so that rather than being a really fat stack of, of fabric and wadding to bind, then it's kind of like a little less bulky. That was just one step that I added that isn't in the instructions, but probably should be, honestly. So then I just followed the regular steps to bind a seam and then I pressed it flat and I hand basted it flat. And then from the green side, I top stitched along where my basting was to catch that flat edge of the binding. So that on the uh, green and orange side, you can see that there looks, just looks like this little detail stitch. And then on the purple side, there's two lines of stitching running along either side of the bound seam. And that's where it, everything ended up. This whole process of flat binding the seams took forever, but I am so glad that I did it because I've already worn this jacket several times since then, both the green side and the purple side out. And it just, it feels really nice and refined to have these flat bound seams. I just think they look so cool. I'll probably do it in another project for sure. And if you didn't make it reversible and if you didn't flat bind all of the seams, then this process would be a much, 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 much quicker process. Although the quilting does take a really long time. Okay, I'm gonna run you through a little summary of my pros and cons for this pattern and to give you a final bit of a review now that I've done the summary of putting this whole thing together. But I have been thinking about this jacket for so long that I kept reaching for it in my wardrobe even before I had made it. That's how long it had lived in my head. I believed that it was an item of clothing that I could just pick up and wear. And now I'm so glad that I have it, that I, can just like go and pick it up and, and put it on and it just makes me so happy. So the pros list of this pattern is gonna be shorter than the cons list, so I'll start there. The pro is that it's a very easy pattern to cut out. The instructions are pretty clear and I think that if it, for a quilting project, it's very straightforward if it's something that you wanted to have a go at. I wanna say it's a good entry level quilting project. So if you know that you're confident <laughs> stitching in straight lines, then I would say it's the project for you. The cons list is that this project is super duper duper time consuming. <laughs> and I had really underestimated how long it was going to take. The second thing that's kind of strange is that the fabric width is given, like for a non-standard width that we have in Australia, I think it's given at 135 or 140 centimeters. And in Australia, the two most common fabric widths that we have is like a 112 or 115 and a 150. So I can't remember how much I bought to begin with. I think I probably bought maybe two and a half meters of each. 
and I still have a little bit left which I'm probably going to use for other projects or I'm going to make some really cool bias now that I know how to do that. The instructions are kind of a little annoying. They instructions use photos rather than illustrations for the steps which I feel like if you're a beginner sewer it's not going to be as clear as if you're following illustrated instructions. There's just something lost in the clarity of the photos that might be a little bit tricky to follow. Other thing is that there's no numbers or headings given for the different steps in the pattern. I really appreciate um, Gracie Steele's patterns because she knows that her audience is sometimes they're beginner sewists sometimes they're more advanced and she gives like a little summary with no pictures or anything about bang 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 these are the steps that you're going to follow to produce this pattern so that you don't need to be flicking through so many pages of instructions so i love that about her patterns and that doesn't even exist in this pattern because i made it reversible i totally skipped the pockets and there are just pages and pages and pages of instructions about how to do the pockets for this pattern and it was kind of annoying because I kept trying to flick back and forward in the instructions and there wasn't even a heading about like pocket construction or bodice construction or stuff like that and they weren't even numbered so I couldn't even keep that in my head. A bit of a pain. Fit for this pattern is really massive. I think it's meant to be oversized. I downloaded the extra small and small pattern but on the actual pattern pieces and in the instructions it doesn't make explicit what is the small and what's the extra small. I think I ended up making the small which is kind of why it's so big on me and yeah it's meant to be oversized but the fit just doesn't quite work unless you have something quite bulky on underneath. I know I probably, it's a bit of user error, I probably could have checked the garment measurements myself and actually done that due diligence before I started cutting out and sewing, but it's just not something that is part of my process. So maybe I, I need to make that part of my process. I don't know. That's some feedback for myself. <laughs> Finally, the sizing I think is, the sizing availability for this pattern I think is okay, but I did get some DMs from people saying that, yeah, Vicky Sew's patterns are great, but they don't have a great size range. I really think it depends on the style that you're going for because looking on their Etsy site I feel like they go anywhere from like a size 0 or 2 up to like a 24 with some sizes. Uh, I don't know, let me know what you think. Have you had experience with trying to sew something from Vicky Sews and their pattern sizing isn't available for you? Please, I would really love to hear it. I haven't sewn that many independent patterns and this is my first time sewing a Vicky Sews pattern so I don't have any other experience to go by. Finally, with all of that being said, I do love this jacket being oversized and quite fun and whimsical from that perspective because I can fit a bulky jumper underneath, which makes it great for layering. And I can also confirm that the felt wadding is totally legit. It is exactly warm enough for the climate here in Sydney, especially in the last two weeks when it has not stopped raining. <laughs> The ultimate question, I suppose, though, for any pattern review is would I make it again? And I would say yes, but probably with some alterations. I also wouldn't make it reversible again because that just took way too long to finish with all of the flat binding and everything. I would recommend this pattern if this is the style of jacket that you're trying to find, but I would say that for beginners, some of the instructions might not be super easy to follow. I think they probably have a YouTube tutorial you can go along with as well, so that might help. I don't know, I didn't follow it myself. I give this pattern, the Cheryl Jacket by Vicky Sews, a solid seven out of 10. Are there any patterns that you want me to try and sew? And I will review them and give you my honest perspective. Let me know.